Generic Carlson be on the move. T. Oscar Hernandez is on the move. And Team Canada is on the move to Qatar. The World Cup starts Sunday. All that and more at Sports Corn TV. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Sports Corn TV. Chris Dobson, Jerry Green in your living room and on your computer. This is going to be a good one this week, Jerry. We've got a lot to talk about uh, as listed off the hop. You heard everything that are kind of important. We're going to go into the discussions, a lot of things happening, but we are going to start, of course, typically where we do, and that's in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. And where I want to start now is I want to talk about the St. John Sea Dogs, and that is, are we back in year zero of a Sea Dogs rebuild after the Memorial Cup win last year? Well, that's usually the case, Chris. Um, and the Sea Dogs have done it more than once. And the history is that's what happened. Now, of course, when the Huberdos and the Josephs were there, um, it seemed to, they got them in their prime at 18, and then they still had them at 19 and had a chance to go back to back. But those are, those are rarities indeed. And you know, we talked about last week about the Charlottetown Islanders and how consistent they've been, but now they seem to be running out of uh, stock on the shelves, if you would, if you would. But uh, I think it's just typical uh, major junior and or junior hockey, uh, be it junior A or major junior, where they stock up and try to win a championship and um, and develop. Of course, you're always developing because this is what St. John's doing now. Those draft picks, those younger players are coming in. They're developing them and guiding them towards two, three, two years down the road where they'd have maybe another opportunity, maybe three years down the road. And then they put the pieces into place like they always do. So and no surprise where St. John is in the standings. I know it must be as a fan, you want to go to the rink and, and see that they're going to win. And right. this particular season, maybe less wins at home than usual. But that is the pain that goes with the game. Well, you know, I, I had a great opportunity. So this week I actually was welcomed. Adam has filled in for you a couple of times. Adam and Jeremy welcomed me onto the podcast this week. And they were talking about it. We were talking about St. John and, you know, what Trevor Georgie may end up having to do come trade deadline time. Because, of course, obviously a lot of the veterans who have moved on in advance, like what does he have as far as assets go? And you start looking down that roster and you're like, who's got any value in St. John that people are going to come looking for your veterans. So like your Brady Burns, for example, will they look at moving Peter Reynolds, for example? I mean, is that something that could be on the radar? What kind of assets could he require get back in, in regards to that? And, you know, so as far as I'm concerned, it's like, all right, well, you know, Trevor kind of, and you're right. That's the junior hockey cycle every four years. If it's done properly, I'm not sure the Halifax mm-hmm. Mooseheads who seem to be good every year is that, do they go through a full-blown rebuild? Because Trevor's proven time and time again, he knows how to maximize assets. He knows how to do what he's doing. So I'll be very curious to see, but I agree with you. I think, you know, obviously when you win, you sacrifice this for to get your name on the hardware, of course. Um, So yeah, so I'll be really curious. I would say, I wouldn't even necessarily say we're at year zero. I would say, you know, Trevor, I'd you know, we're about one or two years in, but about another two, three years, I think they could be in a situation where St. John will be looking to contend again. Uh, but overall, from the New Brunswick side of things, I would have to think that they're going to be probably on the second half of the season, they'll probably be down in the lower echelon. I would Chris, think. you remember in 2019 where you were in March of 2019? Of course, with that, in the booth with uh, you. Unbelievable Wildcat team that was going for a championship and a, a Memorial Cup that uh, COVID stepped in and took that away from them. And here we are now in 2019. Now we're in 2022-23 season. The Wildcats are rebuilding, but Chris, I still don't think they're in a position to really go for it or make an extra run or add some uh, uh, acquisitions uh, during the trade period to propel themselves a little bit further in the standings. The standings to me and the, and the cream of the crop has to be your Sherbrooke and Quebec. Quebec sitting on top, Chris, at 17-1-1. One one. They haven't lost a game in 15 games. Um, I just don't think it's the year to go. I don't think they have the depth to go. And I, I, I just think it would I- I inhibit uh, a more of a, a, another push maybe next season rather than this they've been playing very good hockey and they're going to make a bit of noise in the postseason providing they don't get hit with a Halifax in the first round or something along right. those lines but as far as people talking about the Sherbrooke's and the Quebec's of the world what not enough people are doing is not enough people have the Halifax Mooseheads names in the mouth of the people who are going to contend this year and I'll tell you right now Halifax is a goaltender and maybe one defenseman away from being a legit contender and that goaltender I could see and I know it's early I'm going to speculate 
but don't count out Le Pen and Charlottetown because, you know, Halifax is going to have the assets. They're going to have to move somebody. He could be a great fit in Halifax. And as far as I'm concerned, the Halifax Mooseheads are where they are in the standings right now. I think they're two points behind uh, either Quebec or they're, they're really close. It's not, it's not very far off. They've done this all without Zachary, LaRue, Zachary right. LaRue, who is, don't forget, rehabbing an injury. So they're saying he could hopefully be skating here in the near future. Plus, don't forget, Team Canada's playing a World Junior Hockey Championship in Halifax this Christmas. It would be shocking if he's not 100%, if he's at least not invited to be there. And imagine getting a guy like him back to bolster Team Canada, fill the stands with people, with a hometown guy in Halifax. I think it would be ridiculous. But overall, it would be great to see. I'm, I'm, I'm banking on Halifax. I think Halifax can take Quebec in a seven-game series if they add the right situation. But that's just my two cents. Yeah. Still with hockey, Chris, uh, I enjoyed uh, the uh, Hall of Fame weekend in Toronto, and I certainly, and Amazing. again, Chris, I'm not I'm not a hard-shelled outer guy, and there was a tear in my eye to see Borja Salmin out there, and to see Daryl Sittler uh, break down the way he did along his uh, longtime teammate uh, on the ice and how the fans responded, that is one of those memories and one of those uh, 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 feelings you don't get all the time, but it certainly was well done in Toronto, and I I appreciated everything about it. It was so nice to see, and, and you know, see the Sedins. One thing I thought that was really cool was because they were all there, even in a local, like a current young player in Toronto, William Nylander standing there doing what he was doing. Like, it was such an emotional moment, and you were bang on. Like I said, when it comes to this stuff, I, I, I tend not to shed a tear because, you know, sports is life, but I was, there, I was right there with you, and, you know, what a, what a great Hall of Fame ceremony it was. Um, you know, to see him there in Toronto with his old teammates, man, just, it, it was hard. It was gut-wrenching. I loved it. And the Leafs started, I think, five or six Swedes. Yeah. I don't know if the goaltender's Swedish or not. I don't, I don't think so. But they started five players that were of uh, uh, from Sweden. So that was pretty cool. A former Leaf isn't doing very well out in Edmonton, Chris. And what's your perspective on, here's Jack Campbell. Now, Jack Campbell, I did some research, Chris, six and four out in Edmonton. 4.27 goals against average and an 873 save percentage. His career numbers, Toronto, LA, Chris, are 2.65 and a save percentage of 913. They say he can get in his head. It looks like he's got into his own head. So I saw a great segment uh, with the guys uh, nationally talking about Jack Campbell. You know, when the Oilers made the acquisition for Campbell, it's because they were looking for, for, for veteran depth. They figured, look, we've got the team in front of him. We yes. just need him to stop the pucks he needs to stop. And, you right. know, for him to go, you are right. It's all about a mental capacity. And one thing that was being said about it, because as Jack Campbell's currently getting ripped apart in the media for being, what was the word I heard them use? Uh, atrocious was the word I heard. <laughs> and somebody defended him and said, first of all, I don't think you need to pile onto that. Everybody knows Jack Campbell has issues with his own mind. And the minute he gets down, he's like, all Jack Campbell needs to do is look Jack Campbell in the eye, in the mirror and say, look, I'm playing like garbage. I need to be better. He'll fix himself out. He's proven time and time again, he's capable of winning. You, you spouted off the numbers himself, a career 913 save percentage. That's pretty damn good uh, yeah. at this point, right? So at the end of the day, I think Jack Campbell is going to be fine. The minute he starts to solidify, you know, that Oilers team is going to come back together. Are they starting to lose a little confidence in them too? I don't think it's time to hit the panic button yet. The Oilers are going to be just fine. Jack Campbell is going to settle in. I understand we're a third of the way through the season. Don't count them out yet. Everything's yeah. going to be fine. I saw a good game the other night, Chris. So your Montreal Canadiens playing the New Jersey Devils. Your Canadiens fell to the Devils, who have won now 10 in a row. But two good young teams, and you throw Ottawa into that mix of two or three good young teams. I think they all have bright futures, Chris, and, and they're developing young players and, and uh, a tremendous amount of talent on all three teams. I think you're absolutely right. I think out of those two teams, even though people talk about the Ottawa Senators themselves, out of the three of them, I, you know, Ottawa made the moves they made to be somewhat good now, um, but it's still young. And yes, they're still building toward that. But when I think of young teams, you're right. You look at what New Jersey's doing now. And I think New Jersey's a year or two ahead of everybody else in this pack mm -hmm. right now. You know, they've built everything they did. You know, they've got Nico Heischer wearing the C and they've, you know, every the Hughes and everything they've done there has been fantastic. Now, if I'm looking at this team and go, okay, in five to seven years, who do I think is going to be the brighter team in the league? I think your New Jersey's, and if you don't think, and I'm not saying this because I'm biased, but Montreal's young team, no, and, and I'm honestly going to no, kind of tone this down a little it. bit. Look, they're oh. fun to watch. 
But if you they look are. at what, you know, the acquisitions that were made by Hughes and Gordon, uh, to me right now, my favorite one hands down is Kirby Doc. I think, you know, the fact that Chicago gave up on him, Alex to bring it, no wonder Jonathan Davis and Patrick Kane are, are furious. But, you know, Doc had something to prove. He did what he had to do. Um, but, yeah, as far as that goes, to me, Montreal and New Jersey are both going to be super exciting. But I like this Sens team. And, again, if you're talking about new ownership, mm-hmm. they're bringing those guys in. Who knows what's going to happen? I mean, if they're going to make this fun, the city's behind it anyway. Yeah, I don't know what's going on in Ottawa. They're on a little bit of a losing slide, and they have to go out on the road here soon. And they seem to have all the ingredients. Now, I know Thomas Shabbat is now on the shelf with concussion protocol for probably a week or two. Um, But they have such energy, and they have such great talent. They move the puck so well. That's why I find they're fun to watch. I find Montreal's fun to watch. And it's funny, watching New Jersey the last few weeks, they've been through Canada. And I guess last night I remember them saying they're undefeated in Canada. I think they've won in Vancouver. They've won in Edmonton. They've won in Calgary. They haven't been to Winnipeg yet, but I'm just saying they've been in, in Canada in the early part of their of their of their season. But it was funny they also mentioned how Lindy Ruff was being booed in the first two games of the season and how quickly things can turn around. And with a young team, Chris, the New Jersey Devils could turn around and be on the bottom end of an eight game losing streak. So it's very interesting. Now, former uh, Ottawa Senator that I want to talk to you about is is uh, is um, uh, Carlson. Um, <laughs> You know, you know how old he is, Chris? He's 32 years old. You know who else is 32 year old? And tell me if you think he's done. John Tavares. John Tavares is 32 years old. Do you think Eric Carlson is done? Or do you think he still has some great value? And maybe he'll leave San Jose? What's super upsetting for me to know is that both those guys are 10 years younger than I am. And I feel like I've been watching them for <laughs> way too long. I feel like I've done nothing with my life. That being said, Eric Carlson's having a comeback year of the yes. ages. Now, if I'm San Jose right now, I am taking calls because his value has never been higher. There's going to be a contender out there somewhere. I'm looking in the general direction of possibly the Edmonton Oilers. Like, why wouldn't you make that phone call? Now, again, cap space could prevent that from happening. You'd have to get mm-hmm. creative because I think there's still four years left on his deal. You were saying before the yeah. show, right? So, um, but if I'm San Jose, there's no way in hell that Eric Carlson finishes this year in a Sharks uniform, unless the asking price is just ridiculous. But if I'm them and not, I would sell that quickly you know they've decided they're going to move on once they move brett burns and all those guys to start the retool i think it's just a matter of time eric carlson has to be fielding phone calls just quick numbers for you chris of course uh Olby is 37 malkin's 36 uh crosby's 35 i want any of those guys on my team and you know claude drew he's 34 and he's still got like so lots of life, lots of life left in him but big trade uh today or the other day i guess for the toronto blue jays chris what's your analysis of t oscar hernandez going to seattle so again, I, the best part of me getting to talk about this is as a non diehard Blue Jays fan, I look at it from one of two perspectives. And that is, yes, from a fan perspective, it's heartbreaking and fans didn't quite understand it. Now, that being said, the jury's still out on the deal, but the Jays had to make a decision. One of those two yeah. corners were going to go. Everyone's been talking about it, it was either going to be Lords Gurriel Jr. or T. Oscar Hernandez. Now, I think from a money perspective, in order to retool properly, I think they had to move to Oscar financially. It just made sense. They do need help. Pitching help is proven time and time again, where they're going to need it. So I'm not sure, like I said, this will be a, let's wait and see how this pans out, but don't think the blue Jays don't have something up their sleeve, because if you're going to move a guy like him, like don't forget in game two of that, uh, of that, uh, that playoff game, Hernandez had two dingers himself that game against Seattle. And then they came back. And of course that was the game. They blew that major lead and lost. But overall, like I felt for the fans, the fans are upset about it, but just hang tight guys. There's a reason that you guys are all sitting watching on the couch and those guys making calls up in the room. Five seasons with the Blue Jays, uh, Chris, and really a, a model of consistency. Last year, he had 25 home runs and 75, uh, 77 RBI. He had uh, 35 doubles to boot. And also on top of that, if you look at his career numbers, very consistent to those numbers. He played 651 games, 133 uh, home runs, 380 RBI, and batted 262. His average last year, 267. So he's really been a model of consistency. Seattle's getting a tremendous player. It's just a matter of the Blue Jays can't keep all the talent. Uh, Once they start to blossom, you can't keep them all. Jays fans were rattled when Marcus Simeon got traded and that worked out for them. Anyways, Jerry, yes. let's talk about the NFL. I'm going to get your final thoughts on last week. There's a couple <laughs> games. I know you've got some opinions on it because you have no problem sharing that with me. I love football and I love, 
watching coaches blow situations. Let's talk about blown situation number one. Why do you have Josh Allen doing a sneak from the one yard line? Can he drop back and make a quick pass? Can you, you know, I, 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 I don't like handing it off to a running back in the end zone and have him hit the line. But to have him, and then some some people think maybe that hand or that uh, elbow was bothering him, and that's why he he did drop the ball. But now they've got the Vikings on this pedestal because they beat uh, they they uh, beat the Bills. But the Bills went up and down the field on the Vikings. The Vikings are fortunate to get a victory here. I know they sit you know in the standings at uh, eight and one with the Eagles now. But I still think they're not a team, and we're going to get to the subject about who do you think is a team to watch in either the NFC or the AFC. The Dallas Green Bay game was also hilarious. Dak Prescott is totally overrated if he can't guide his team to a victory. And they put up the stat, Chris, 194 times where the Dallas Cowboys have been leading by 14 points in the uh, fourth quarter and never lost, 194-0. and Well, as soon as they put that stat up, Green Bay came back. <laughs> And one, and then the Monday night are Washington and Philadelphia. I loved watching Washington just run the ball, run the ball, run the Heineke, ball. Heineke, baby, for Heineke. Forty minutes. It was unbelievable. But the the Eagles were due. They turned the ball over, made some bad mistakes. They were due for loss. And I really enjoyed last weekend in the NFL. Look, nothing just made me more excited than you and I sitting here in our in our basements talking about sports and you calling Dak Prescott overrated. I think that was the greatest thing I've seen tonight. <laughs> But I do agree with you. Uh, but he hasn't won a thing. He hasn't won a thing, Chris. Oh, my goodness. You sound like you're yes. talking about Clayton Kershaw four years ago. Yeah. Um, overall, this week coming up, uh, you know what? You look at the Tennessee Green Bay game. Um, that's a big – as a Colts fan, that's a huge game. I need Aaron Rodgers to figure it out and stop Tennessee. Um, but, again, I don't know what's going on in Green Bay right now. That no. will be in Lambeau. It will be cold. So I'm really hoping that they can uh, figure that out, no problem. Uh, the Jets-Pats game, again – looking forward to it um i i'm not sure what to expect there i need i need bill belichick to get me back thinking bill knows what's going on he has he hasn't had anything up his sleeve ever since brady left there's been never any of this uh finding a diamond in the rough player that comes from nowhere a great running back great receiver great anything they just there has been no uh polish to the New England Patriots in the last few seasons. And I'm really hoping to see them take more control of the ASC East by beating the Jets on Sunday. That'll be a good way. And I think it's in New England, isn't it? Yes, Yes, it is. It it won't be an easy task, but they will. I think, you know, I'm with you. I mean, I'm not a Pats fan by any means, but Bill Belichick was always associated with greatness. And I Mm -hmm. feel like since Brady decided to pack his bags and go, although now rumor has it he wants to play in the CFL. Because he's won outside of outside of the U.S. <laughs> Apparently, his record's now four and zero. But overall, you know that game will be a good one. Uh, you know the Chiefs Chargers game. Um, you know I, it, there's a lot of good games this week. Yes. Uh, and again, of course, the Colts have the Eagles. Wait, wait, wait. Who's the team, Colts right? playing? So, Who are the Colts playing? Who are they playing? The, the Philadelphia Eagles. They're playing the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, the o o and one Philadelphia Eagles. One game at so a time. So Chris, here um, this is funny. Here you have uh, head coach of the Montreal Canadiens, no coaching experience. Your favorite team, your favorite football team, the Indianapolis Colts. Their head coach has no coaching experience. High school. Any high school. Him, guides into yes. High school. Okay. But again, it, it's it, it's interesting, and that'll be a good game to see if the Colts have really turned a corner, and if you know they they have have found something in 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 their new head coach. But Cowboys at the Vikings will be uh, quite fascinating because, uh, as I say, the Vikings aren't invincible. Uh, most of their wins have been from behind or close victories at the end of games. Eight and one looks great. And they in the, in the Eagles are eight and one, but in the other conference, Chris, you got Kansas city at seven and two, and then everybody else is either five and four, six and three and all of that going on. And it, it just seems like wild cards are wide open in the NFL. And that's, what's making it fun uh, down the stretch as we, as we go into the last, uh, uh, I guess it would be six games of the season. Cause they're playing week 11 uh, this week. But uh, let's move on to other football, Chris. What about the World Cup? And what are you expecting from Team Canada as they head to Qatar? I am extremely excited for this. I've been excited for this since they, since they made it. Uh, you know, as far as the expectations go, I mean, remember, the last time Team Canada was in the World Cup was in 1986. There was a lot of different expectations this time versus last time. 
Uh, it all starts with John Herdman. John Herdman transitioned over to be their bench boss in 2018. He has completely shifted the mindset of the players, the locker room, all that stuff that's going on. Plus, you got to remember this year's Team Canada squad, led by Alfonso Davies, hopefully, uh, it's got eight players who've had experience in the Champions League. Now, look, they're going to have a tough division. They've avoided the group mm-hmm. of death, which is extremely important. Uh, you know, they've got a real opportunity here. Now, it's going to go one of two ways. This group, I think, if you come out with four points, you could advance. So yes. I could see Canada coming out, grabbing a win against Croatia or Morocco, then possibly drawing against the other. Or who knows? This could be a completely shift in the other way. They could lose everything, come away with zero points. But either way, it's going to be a completely great bracket for them. It could have been way worse. Um, you know, the problem is going to be Belgium, who is one of the favorites to win the entire thing. I mean, they always the final. Yeah, right. So, I mean, that's going to be their toughest challenge. I don't see any scenario where Canada comes away with that. But hey, John Herdman has proven to the world and he has shocked the world before yeah. with the women's team. So anything's possible. I'm not going to hold it out, but I do think I'm an optimist. I'm saying Canada comes out of the group. I think they do win one. They draw the other. I think they come away with the four points. And as far as I'm concerned, I think that's how it's all going to roll. Canada advances, they advance from the group. Well, Jerry, all great things must come to an end. And for that, I say it's time to wrap this thing up. So we're going to start huge news. Of course, the great cup is this weekend. I know you're a big CFL guy. Let me have it. What are your predictions? What do you think is going to happen? Huge news. It is the news, Chris. The 109th Great Cup is happening. It's the Canadian Football League Championship game, and it's in Regina on Sunday. Uh, Kickoff is 7 p.m. Atlantic, Chris, if you needed to know. That means 5 p.m. local time in Regina. Interesting, the weather is supposed to be minus one and sunny, but you know what happens at 5 o'clock? It starts to get dark and the temperature starts to drop. So it should be cold uh, night for the championship in the Canadian Football League. It's the Toronto Argonauts against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Argos finished the season 12-7, and seven, beat Montreal in the Eastern Final. Winnipeg bumped off BC in the Western Final. They finished 16-3. and three. Here's what you need to know. The Bombers have the best defense. They got the best offensive line. That's all you need to know. Winnipeg will run it down uh, the Argonauts' throat, so to speak. I'm going to predict Winnipeg 28-13 over the Argonauts. The uh, betting line, Chris, we're going to do some of that. Uh, Four and a half point favorites are the Bombers and the over under is 48. So take the point and also take the under if you're going to bet on the Grey Cup this Sunday. Manager of the Year were announced in baseball, Chris. Who were they? This is actually really cool because Buck Showalter was named National League Manager of the Year. He is the third to win it four times. It's his fourth win, but he's the first to do it with four different teams. He won it with the Mets the Yankees, the Rangers, and the Orioles. Wow. I think that's awesome. Now, on the American League side of things, you know, look at Terry Francona. No surprise there. It's his third time winning in the American League. Uh, you know, Francona, Guardians manager, and then, of course, you know, former Red Sox manager. It's, it's, it's great to see him out there. Uh, I'm a big Frank, Francona guy. I love the fact that he won that American League, but how can you not love Showalter? Four times, four different teams. I think that's awesome. Sticking with you, sticking with football, but we're going to take the local circuit because there's a lot of news happening. Let's hit it. Yeah, lots of local uh, football news, and it all wrapped up at Rocky Stone on the on the weekend. Chris Riverview High School Royals won their first championship in AAA High School man, uh, boys 12 man football. Let's be clear about that. They've been to the final nine times. It's their first victory for their head coach Kevin Jones. He he and his students uh, beat St. John High School Greyhounds 23-22. Congratulations to them. The AA champs in high school 12 man was Matthew Martin beating the Odyssey by a score of 20, uh, 32 to 27. Congratulations to them. And then there's the double A nine man of which the James and Hill Tommies were the defending chance, but they fall in the final to the Ross A Red Hawks, 42 to six. The AUS had their playoffs on the weekend too, Chris, and it was St. FX beating Mount Allison 21 to 14, and they win the Loney Bowl and they will host the UTEC Bowl, which is this Saturday against the Saskatchewan Huskies. Huskies are ranked fourth in the country. Meanwhile, Laval, who's number two, and Western, who are number one, will play in the Mitchell Bowl. The winner goes to the Vanier Cup. Chris, uh, it was a great Sunday for Saturday. Is that right? Oh, my goodness. I, I was waiting for this all show. I wanted to talk about it. I was excited. we got to give props where props are due. And that is, of course, new Colts head coach Jeff Saturday gets his first win of the season in his first game debut. They had Parks Frazier never <laughs> called a play in his life working the, calling the offense. Either way, 
Everyone called an audible right off the hop because Matt Ryan, who was supposed to be benched for the season, comes out and starts taking snaps on, on the first drive of the game. Colts, for the first time all season long, went into the half with the lead. They come away with a 25-20 to 20 win over the Raiders. Huge win. Toughest part of that was watching Derek Carr cry during the press conference. All I know is that this week is going to be a little tougher because they've got the Eagles coming off that loss. But either way, Saturday on Sunday is clutch. Let's see if he can go again <laughs> two in a row. Give us an MHL update, Jerry. I know it's near and dear to your heart. Yeah, I like to give you who's hot and who's not. But in this case, it's who's hot. The Campbellton Tigers are hot, Chris. They've won their last four. And the impressive thing about it, they've won victories against the two division leaders on the road. They won in Summerside and they won in Truro. They're just one point back of the North defeating leading uh, Summerside Western Capitals. And interesting this weekend, they're in Edmondson and they're in the Miramichi. Those are the two games to watch as the Campbellton Tigers are the hottest team in the MHL and the hottest player in the MHL, you know his name, Chris Dawson Stairs. He's played 12 games in Campbellton, 12 goals, 12 assists for 24 points. Maybe that's why the Tigers are 4-0 in this last couple of weeks. The Montreal Canadiens are getting some help on the blue, John, blue line. Chris, can you explain? Yeah, it's been a long time coming. Looks like Mike Matheson will make his regular season debut with the Montreal Canadiens sometime this week. Uh, head coach Marty St. Louis said he wasn't sure exactly whether or not he could play as early as Thursday. Uh, that being said, you know, we got injured against the preseason game against the Ottawa Senators. Uh, you know, he was acquired a big trade. That was the trade that sent uh, Jeff Petrie and Ryan Paling to Pittsburgh. You know, drafted by the Florida Panthers was part of a big deal there. Now, the cool thing about Mike Matheson is that he is a Quebec native. So this is like a homecoming for him. He's very excited to be a part of this roster. Now, the only challenge is going to be with the young core on that blue line is there's a couple options on who's coming out of the lineup because if he's coming in, someone's got to go and it's going to be at the hands of either Arbor Jack Guy or Jonathan Kovacevic. Now they did say, uh, I was reading an article this week that says Montreal told Kovacevic to find a place to live in Montreal. So read into that with what you will. I mean, Laval's still there, but between him or Jack Guy, who's played an absolute great start to the season with the Montreal Canadiens on that blue line, one of them, unfortunately, it's a numbers game. And when you're getting a guy like Mike Matheson, he's going to help in every aspect you can. Uh, fun fact of the day, of course, Mike Matheson drafted by the Moncton Wildcats. Never played a game here, though. Decided to go NCAA. And yeah. uh, I think he played at Northeastern. But either way, it'll be a good addition to the Montreal Blue Line. I'm sure they're excited to get him back, especially now they've got a couple of injuries coming up. It looks like Jonathan Drouin is out for the next month. Um, but overall, we'll see what happens. But hold, it'll, it'll bolster the Blue Line, and I'm excited. Well, Jerry... It has been another great episode this week. We hope everybody's had fun. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next Thursday.